So lymphomas are the most common type of cancer that we see in the adolescent and young adult or AYA uh, age group. Um, they're a lot less frequent in younger children, um, but once you hit that teenage years, you know, the incidence really goes up, uh, particularly Hodgkin lymphoma, which is the most common type we see in that age group. But there are many challenges for adolescents and young adults with lymphoma, especially compared to older patients. Uh, for example, for the younger patients, the adolescent patients under the age of 18, uh, many of the new experimental approaches uh, are not available. You know, the clinical trials typically will only enroll starting at 18. So there is a delay in getting access, you know, to these really important new therapies. Um, another big issue is the side effects of the treatments, particularly in the long term. Uh, there are certain side effects such as, you know, breast cancer risk from radiation treatment that's commonly used for Hodgkin lymphoma that adolescents and young adults are much more susceptible to. And then the kind of a, another third issue is just that, you know, because of the time point that one is at during adolescent and young adulthood, it's a time where people are moving away from their families, taking independence, getting started in their education or their careers. And then when faced with such a life-threatening illness and having to, you know, again, be under the care of their family or other, you know, uh, caregivers, it, it can be emotionally, you know, very difficult for this uh, particular group of patients. So some of the side effects of, of the treatments, you know, have a particularly big impact on in adolescents and young adults. Uh, fertility is, is, a, is a big one. You know, these are patients that, you know, oftentimes have really not started their childbearing, you know, and that's important to them. Yet some of our therapies, you know, can either uh, reduce or completely eliminate um, the ability to have children. So this group, you know, especially needs to have counseling, needs to understand what their options are so that that can be part of the decision making around the treatment. You know, in terms of treatment, I think there still are, you know, a lot of differences between how pediatric oncologists, you know, treat versus medical oncologists. Um, so there is a bit of a gap and although we're trying to move closer together, I think from the, you know, the pediatric oncology perspective, uh, we, you know, because our patients are younger, that many of our treatment strategies take into effect the concern about the long-term side effects of treatment. So that some of the chemotherapy or radiation plans are different than those used in adults because of the concern of the long-term effects on the developing body and in the younger population. Um, that being said, on the adult side, there's incorporation of targeted therapies and you know, other novel approaches, often at an earlier time point than it is in the pediatric side because of access and availability of clinical trials. So you know, a, a big need is for us to come together, you know, and that's what we're beginning to do. Um, but there still are some differences, you know, both in terms of what's currently available as, as well as some philosophical differences. At Cetris or Brentuximab Vidotin, which is the anti-CD30 uh, antibody drug conjugate that's really changed the landscape for Hodgkin lymphoma, you know, the original trial only included nine pediatric patients, so we had some information, but, um, but not much in, in patients under the age of 18. You know, fortunately, now there are trials, you know, around the world, across the whole age group, um, and so it is beginning to, to um, you know, change practice for everyone, including the AYA patients. The clinical trial access for adolescent and young adults with lymphoma has been a big issue. You know, a lot of our research has shown that, you know, compared to younger patients and older patients, that entry onto clinical trials is much, much lower for this particular age group. And, you know, it's complicated. There's a lot of different reasons for it. Some is availability of trials. You know, some is that, that people are being treated in the community where they might not be offered uh, a trial. But you know, fortunately these days, there's been a really big push in trying to improve um, access to clinical trials for the AYA population. And we're also beginning to collaborate. Uh, for example, the pediatric clinical trials groups and the adult clinical trials groups are working together. You know, we're beginning to plan trials that, spage, that really span the whole age group so that these patients will be able to you know, hopefully have improved access to trials. 
it's, you know, it's really critical for AYA patients to, you know, continue to have long-term cancer care. You know, these are young patients, you know, they have a, a very long life to live ahead of them and many of the side effects of the treatments, you know, won't appear till years or even decades, you know, after the treatment is completed. We um, also know that many of our therapies are associated with accelerated aging. You know, we see um, heart disease, you know, lung disease, second cancers at much earlier rates than, you know, than a, a somebody who had never gone through this therapy does. So it's really important that AYA patients continue to be monitored by experts in the long-term side effects of cancer treatment, uh, that they, you know, continue to follow up for care. And again, you know, our research suggests that they often don't do this and, you know, um, and that can really lead to complications that are missed or, you know, picked up at a more advanced stage. So particularly for this younger age group, it's really critical that they remain in care. There are many opportunities for AYA lymphoma patients to be involved and to be advocates for the disease. They can get involved with Lymphoma Research Foundation. Uh, they're, you know, they can get involved with other organizations. You know, I think the important thing is to demonstrate awareness that lymphoma comes in many different sizes and shapes. Um, I think it's important for people to realize that one can be treated for lymphoma and be cured and still, you know, live a, a very active, you know, life. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions out there, and I think particularly for the AYA group. So by being an advocate, getting involved, you know, it sends a message. It also helps researchers and physicians like myself, you know, know what the priorities are. You know, we really rely on the feedback from our patients in order to, you know, help us determine what some of the next steps should be. You know, what's really exciting about lymphoma right now is just, you know, how we're translating the biology into clinical practice, you know, for real, you know, with the immune therapies, with, you know, drugs such as brentuximab, adotin, you know, we're not just giving nonspecific chemotherapy or radiation to everyone. So, um, and those gains are, you know, being realized by the AYA patients too. I think for me, what I'm most excited about are the collaborations between pediatric oncology and medical oncology and how we're beginning to work together and develop, you know, approaches that are really targeted at that AYA population. The specific side effects, you know, the psychosocial aspects, you know, all of that are being, you know, incorporated so that we have, you know, uh, treatment approaches that really reflect the needs of that population.